Mobile phones, electronic devices, silent. All right, leaders, we're going to kick it up right now. The man is going to show you in his workshop how you can build your own personal brand, as he said earlier just now. Please, once again, a big warm round of applause. Please welcome Phil Slominski. Hey there. Nashville, Tennessee, U.S. of A. Hang on a second. Is this August 15th already? Am I in Taipei? That's starting to make sense because man, that was a long flight from Canada. But it's great, it's great to be here. The reason I make uh, reference to Nashville is earlier this year in March, I had a great opportunity to give this talk at the LAP meeting in Nashville. I had a great time. It was a great meeting and I can say it's got the same, the same energy here. The other advantage that it's given me to meet with you today is it's brought me to a part of the world that I've never been to before. And it's absolutely beautiful. I'm actually taking two weeks after this meeting to tour around a bit with my, my beautiful wife Grace that's here with me to do a tour and get to see the region. I also have the honor of one of my friends and managers in our office that was originally born in Beijing, now works in Montreal. So we have an instant translator, we have a tour guide, and Tom Pang, if you would stand up. You can see we also have a bodyguard. Tom is going to take care of us. He's going to take care of us when we're out there. So looking forward to getting to know the region a little bit more. Thanks for spending time with me today on building your personal brand. Let me just make sure this works. There we go. I've given this talk to a number of constituencies. I've given this talk before to salespeople, to leaders, to directors, to wholesaling teams, to head office teams, to leadership teams. It goes on and on. So I just want to encourage you, whatever role you have, if the stories might seem very uh, narrow in focus, that's just to illustrate the points. The points that I'm going to make today would impact and you can implement a, across a wide spread breadth of the people in your organization. Three things I want to talk about today amongst others, but we're going to be able to get out of this presentation is one, be aware of the importance of a strong personal brand. Number two, build a strong and appropriate personal brand and leverage your brand to attract talent. We've talked a lot about recruiting over the last couple of days, that's for sure. Now sometimes when you think brand, your mind automatically goes to logo, website, business card, and that makes sense. What we want to talk about today is not in conflict with that. Branding is very important for your business. What we want to talk about is your personal brand, how you're perceived, how people look at you. As a matter of fact, in our office, we do have a logo. Tom would know we have a logo in our office that everybody rallies around. We're very proud of it. It represents our office. I would love to show it to you today, but I've never shown it to our compliance department. I've never thrown it by them, so this way I can just deny it. But when I really think about it, back in my office in Montreal, I have about 200 golf balls with the logo printed on there, so I'm not very bright. I think it's, it's out there already. I will show you, this is our logo that myself, Tom, and the rest of our team are very proud of. So we do absolutely believe in branding, but today we want to talk about your personal brand, how you're perceived by, by others. Quick background, where did this presentation come from? This was built uh, a, a couple of years ago. Where did this presentation come from? Number one, I took my personal role, my current role I've had for about five years. We have uh, a sales agency of about 15 managers, close to 300 advisors, and I took that role over about five years ago. When I got to meet the team, I've done a number of things within the organization, so I've always been within the same company, but this happened to be a new role for me. When I took over that particular role, and I got to meet the team, some players I had already had dealings with, so I knew who they were because I was in the same organization. Some were new to me, but I went around and I got to meet the team, got to get to know them a, a little bit more, and it was 
very obvious to me early on who was going to get the job done and who might be falling short. Just in getting to know them for a short period of time. And I found myself more and more, when I was talking to the group that was not getting the job done, I caught myself saying time and time again, maybe it's your brand. When they would say, I can't get advisors to my meetings, I can't get them to cooperate with the rest of the, the team, should I make it a mandatory? Should I be more forceful? And I found myself answering more and more, maybe it's not your technique, maybe it's your brand. When they would say, I can't get any advisor referrals, like much of you, we're always, we're always building our, our, our teams and we're always trying to get advisor referrals to bring new people on onto the team, I caught myself saying time and time again, when they would say, I can't get any advisor referrals, should I have a contest? Should I be more forceful? Should I ask more often? And I found myself saying over and over, maybe it's not your technique. Maybe it's your brand. Maybe your brand doesn't say, introduce me to somebody and I will build this person to success. So it might not be your te technique, it might be your brand. And those words, brand, personal brand, started to circulate in the halls of our, of our agency, in the halls of our office. So that was a significant part of where this comes from. The second part, for those of you that are leaders, in this office, one of the thing in this room, one of the things that I enjoy the most of my role is coaching and mentoring people. And we're always coaching, sometimes we're situational coaching in the moment, we're giving advice, we're helping people see a, get a different point of view on things. But what I really enjoy is what I call proactive coaching and mentoring. So with most of my directors, most of the time, I have some project on the go, some gap that they want to fill. And I've worked on things like uh, time management, building better presentations, building better team meetings, finding better sources of recruiting. These are things that I've, I've been able to work with my team. When I do these meetings, as a matter of fact, for those of you that are interested in doing something like that, I call them pure meetings. So if I'm working on a project with Tom as an example, I always do it outside of our office. I'll do it downstairs for a coffee, in the boardroom, that way we're having a pure discussion about the issue at hand, the project, the gap they want to fill, and we're not talking about a million other things. So these are one of the things that I absolutely enjoy, enjoy doing. Now, one of those projects, and I will soon introduce you to one of our team members named Ian Barrett, one of those projects was working on Ian's personal brand because he had some things that he wanted to get better at and a lot of it revolved around his personal brand and the way he was being perceived by people. So that, that particular project, coaching mentoring that I did with Ian, had some legs, had some longevity, and I was able to apply it across a wider breadth of a number of our directors in our organization. So let me introduce you to Ian Barrett. He does not look that good in real life, just so you know, okay? He is a great guy, big part of our team, high energy, highly successful person, always going to conference, always winning awards, but he wasn't doing it the right way. He had all of this, all of this energy, very intense. Let me let you know a little bit about Ian. Ian is the kind of guy that he will say something funny. He'll say something out loud that he thinks is funny and he will laugh at his own joke. And then he will continue to laugh at his own joke. And then he will continue to laugh at his own joke until you laugh. Because you're a little afraid of, of the intensity that Ian has. So, great guy, but he was spending a lot of energy getting the success that he had because everything was a sprint to the finish. Everything was meeting a number at the end of the year. Everything was exhausting to get across that finish line, he was not building any momentum. He had no wind in his sails. Everything was done over and over, repeated, got the numbers, got the success, but he realized there were things that he needed to do better in order to build that momentum and build the team that he wanted to do. The number one thing that we discovered with Ian was his personal brand. 
while he had this great, energetic, light up the room personality, people didn't view him as a business person. People didn't take him seriously as a business person. So the referrals that he was getting to build his team, the success that he was having was with the wrong group of people. He needed to change the perception that people had of him to make him viewed as a business person so he could attract highly successful, ambitious people onto his team and get those wind in the sales. So that's what Ian and I worked on as we transformed a successful, winning individual to somebody that now has some sustainability. And it's not one thing at a time, he now has some sustainability. And that project that we had was building your personal brand. And it was a lot of fun, and I was able to, to throw it across a bunch of other directors in our organization. So, now we'll get to building your personal brand, as I said in the introduction this morning, there are five steps to building your personal brand. Now, I'm gonna start off strong. I'm gonna start off strong, because if there's one thing I want you to think about and remember from this presentation, is you have a brand, whether you like it or not. You may not know what it is, but people have a perception of you whether you like it or not. If you're in your office, and you walk down the hall, and you pass two people that are standing in a doorway, and you walk by, they have something to say about you. Is that true? I said earlier this morning, when you leave a room, what do people say about you? They have something to say about you. You have a personal brand whether you like it or not. I'll give you a quick story. A director that I used to work with years ago, a senior director, a top person in our office. Back in Canada, when Easter rolls around, that's a, that's a, uh, a holiday that we celebrate in Canada, actually around the world, obviously, but the particularity of Canada, uh, around Easter time, there's something called Good Friday and there's something called Easter Monday. In Canada, most companies take one of those days off. Unless you're with the government, you get one of those days off and it's up to the company to decide. Do you take Friday off or you take Monday off? Not a big deal but it kind of floats around and it's really up to the organization what they want to do. So one particular Easter, we officially had Friday off and we were open on Monday. So I came into the office Monday early, I'm not trying to be a hero, I take vacations as well, that's not the point of the story. I come in on Monday, I'm walking down the hall and an advisor sees me and he's joking and he says, hey Phil, what are you doing here? And he catches himself and he says, oh, I don't know. You're not Jim, referring to that other director that, that, uh, that, that I was talking about, that senior director that I was talking about. And the point is subtle, but it is so real. What that advisor was saying in, in his joke is he would never expect to see Jim in the office on a day that was kind of, kind of a floating day. What he was saying about Jim was that Jim's brand was you give the minimum. Not the maximum, Jim's brand was you give the minimum. You have a brand whether you like it or not. I guarantee you that Jim never took a piece of paper, never took a pen, and thought about it, and said I wonder what I want my personal brand to be. And wrote down, I want to give the minimum. Of course he didn't do that, nobody does that. But it was tattooed all over his body. You have a brand whether you like it or not. Now, that was, the first, that was the first step in this project with Ian. You have a brand, whether you like it or not, you might as well find out what it is. So Ian had a very difficult task, very courageous, ambitious project to find out what people thought. He had heart-to-heart -heart conversations with people to understand how they viewed him. Not about his personality, we talked about his personality, how they viewed him as a business person. What was it that he was not shining the light on. You're gonna hear me say that a lot today. So he was just leaving up to chance, whatever people thought of him, it, it was what it was, and that was it. And we had, to, we had to devise a way to understand what parts of his, his incredibly talented background was he not shining the light on? Was he not letting people see in order to get the brand that he wanted? He had, good news for Ian, once he found out, had these conversations, he had a very good brand. 
If you wanted to, if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to dance like uh, like Cyril did up here and put on a show, that was his brand. He had a very good brand, but he didn't have the right brand for the job he wanted to get done. He didn't have the right brand to attract highly successful, ambitious people onto his team. I'll give you an example about good brand and right brand. And I think you'll, you'll recognize uh, these companies. Too big a room to get absolute answers, but if I ask you to think about Skechers, you might say to yourself, uh, comfortable, trendy, uh, young, I think everybody's familiar with, with Skechers shoes. Those are some of the things you might, you might say to yourself. If I throw up Nike, at least in my case, what comes to mind is more high performance, athletic, sports oriented, that's the image that I have of Nike. I think we can agree, I'm not complaining about any of these brands, I think we can agree two good brands. About two years ago, I started to see advertisements of Matt Kutcher, who is an American golfer, probably 15th in the world, uh, starting to do advertisement for Skechers golf shoes. Now, I'm not a great golfer, Tom will tell you, Grace will tell you, but I am an avid golfer. I love golf, and one of my routines in the summer, back in Canada, because we can only play in the summer, winter's very tough, is my Saturday morning golf game with my gang at my golf club. And I started to think about the Matt Kuchar wearing Skechers golf shoes. I started to think about brand. I started to think about right, you know, the right brand versus the good brand, and it wasn't being congruent to me. It wasn't making sense. I was asking myself, what would it take for me to show up on a Saturday morning wearing Skechers golf shoes? And it's a good brand, but it may not be the right brand for the avid golfer. Now they're progressing, I wish them well. They're progressing for sure, but was it, would I pay 25% less? Would I pay 50 to put on Skechers golf shoes? I never found that number and I've never bought a pair. And I guarantee you another thing, it has nothing to do with the shoe. Nothing to do with the shoe. If you cut one of those Nike shoes in half and you cut a Skechers golf shoe in half and you examine them for an hour, you will not see the difference. So it's not about the performance, it's about the brand. Neither one of those golf shoes will stop me from hitting the ball in the woods. Okay, they're not that good. But it's about the right brand versus a good brand. I'll give you, I'll give you a business example. Let me introduce you to an advisor in our office, very successful. I think we, I can also call him a friend. Um, he is a special person. He is, he would not be able to sit in this meeting, by the way, because he's moving all the time. He would not be able to sit in, in a chair for more than 15 minutes. He's moving all the time, highly successful, been with our organization for 15 years. I like to say that Rick Rossi, has more money in his mattress than I have in my pension plan. That's how successful he is. So he's a great guy. We call him, as a matter of fact, the King of LaSalle. This is his little town, a little part of the Montreal city that he's from. He's the King of LaSalle. He knows everybody. He's networking, he's talking, he's out there. He comes into the office in the morning at nine o'clock, leaves at 11 because he's going back to LaSalle. He's going to talk to people. He is a hyperactive business person. So Rick one, one day came to me, back to good brand and right brand, he's got a great brand, came to me one day and said, Phil, I think I want to break into the lawyer market, which is a great ambition, right? Lawyers in, in uh, I know around the world, they might have different reputations. Lawyers in Canada are respected uh, members of our community. It's a great market to be part of, Rick wanted to break into the lawyer market because he had one client and it's a very fruitful market. That's fantastic. You don't want to discourage Rick for sure. But I got to thinking about good brand, right brand. He has a great brand, highly energetic, out there, networking, bouncing off all the time. I'll give you a quick story. Grace and I were, uh, were out at dinner with him and his wife, Gina, a few weeks ago. And we're at a place downtown, very new place, very high energy, up and coming place. When I went to the washroom, it took me about three minutes 
including washing my hands. I go, I leave our table, I go to the washroom, I come back, take about three minutes. You can picture, picture Rick Rossi, it took about 20. Because as he leaves the table and goes towards the washroom, he's talking to this person, wants to meet that person. So probably 20 minutes where it takes me three. And I'm not even sure if he washed his hands. I'm not even sure. He kept, like, he kept on touching the back of my jacket the, the rest of the night. I don't know what that meant. But a whole, you can, you can just get a picture of the personality. So as he sat there saying, I want to get into that lawyer market, that good brand of his, at one point, didn't want to discourage him, had many conversations, but at one point I said, Rick, do you really have the right brand to deal with, with the lawyer market? In Canada, when you, deal with, with, when you deal with lawyers, you have to show up 30 minutes before the meeting, then they leave you waiting another 30 minutes in the lobby, then you go in, you do what you have to do, by the time you get back to your office, there's probably 100 written questions by email that you have to answer back in writing. That is not Rick Rossi. So at one point I said, Rick, you're the king of LaSalle. You have a great brand. I don't know if you have the right brand for that market. And he realized that was absolutely the right thing. He had, a, he had his, his good brand was genius in some parts of what he wanted to do. It was just not gonna fit. And not just for Rick, not just for Rick. The lawyer market is probably not the kind, and they're not looking for the kind of advisor that Rick is as good as he is, and all the success that he has, there's no meshing there. Good brand versus right brand. So step one of building your personal brand, understand you have a brand, whether you like it or not, I encourage you to find out what your brand is. Have those difficult conversations, go around to the people around you, and ask them to give you feedback about what they think your brand is. Second step, so you have a brand whether you like it or not. Second step is define your brand. I talked about it this morning. What is your aspirational brand? How do you want people to perceive you? Uh, I don't remember, I think it was Ed that mentioned yesterday very briefly the book Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. <coughs> so I'm gonna bring that, I'm only gonna bring that back up and I think I'm gonna quote the same chapter that he quoted, which is keep the end in mind. So when I deal with my directors and we embark on this project of building the personal brand, the, the thing that I do with them when we get to this step of the process is we get in that boardroom and I ask them a very simple question. If we line up 10 of your best contacts along the wall, imaginarily, line them up against the wall, 10 of your best contacts, could be family, could be clients, could be mentors, you choose. If we ask them two years from now what they think of you, what they think of you, what would they have to say that would make you the proudest? What would they have to say to make your chest swell? What would get you excited? So when you start to think about that, two years from now, the best people, the most respected people you have in your life, what do you want them to say about you? That's the beginning of defining your brand. That's the beginning of shining the light on the things that you want people to see. So part of the project is physically writing these things out. So I can sit with my director, the one that I'm gonna show you uh, right now is a, a uh, director named, a manager named Steve Persaud on our team, great guy. So I asked Steve to start brainstorming all of those, all of those thoughts in his head. Don't worry about the words, I'm just gonna show you the process. So on the left hand side, you can see a bunch of words that were written. That was the first step of the process. He just brainstormed, what do I want people to say about me? What would make me the proudest? if people viewed me as this type of person. Then, we start to peel back the layer of the onion. Because as you can imagine, different words mean different things to different people. Every time I've done this, this project, everybody writes down professional. It makes sense, who doesn't want to be professional? When I start to ask them, what does professional mean to you? When we start to peel back that layer of the onion, you get totally different answers. Somebody might say professional to me, I want to look successful, I want to look good, I want to look in control. Somebody else might say, 
I want people to know that I respect them, that I listen to them. A third person might say, I want to be reliable. I want people to know that they can count on me. Same word, totally different meaning. So as you look down that, that left hand of the side, those are the definitions that Steve Prasad started to put down after peeling back the layer of the internet. The middle one, by the way, these are real notes. These are actual Steve's notes. We didn't touch them. We just put them on the, on the slide. Then we started to group them. Because when you start to talk about it, peel back the layer of the onion, then you start to understand what is at the core of what's important to this particular individual. What I'm showing you here probably took two months to get to. This is not a quick process. A lot of talking, a lot of reflecting to really get to the core of what's important to that person. So this is the work that Steve Prasad did. We started to bunch them together. Something at this point happened that I was not expecting, and it was a great result, is that the director is working on this project, and it started, uh, it actually didn't start with Steve, but I'll use Steve as an example. They started to actually put together a brand. They actually started to put together a document that represented how they wanted to be viewed, how they wanted to be perceived, and that was not the plan. So it was a fantastic bonus that came out of this project. So here's Steve, you'll see him a little later on as well. Great director in our office, and here's his brand. I'm gonna show you some of the brands from some of the, the managers. They may not mean anything to you, because they might seem very generic. But if you ask a Tom Pang who's in our office, he will tell you this represents them exactly. So from an outside perspective, if you don't know Steve, it just looks like a bunch of positive words, but I can tell you this represents Steve Prasad. And this is how he wants to live his life in the office. These are the things that are important to him. Steve Prasad, always game ready, and he is. He's always game ready, always has a winning attitude, always high energy, always professional, and always welcome, or open door. He is somebody that's very important to him. He's got, he's got he has an amiable side, very important to him, that he knows that people can count on him, that he's there for them. At A. Snow, I don't know if you know this, in, in Quebec, uh, Canada, where I'm from, we speak English and French, so you see, you'll see some, uh, some French names and some French examples up here. At A. Snow, fit to lead, attitude, principle, influence, character, performance. I find that picture of that name looks a lot like me. I don't know if you, if you agree with that. That's a very close, very close facsimile. Neil Brian Gakuda, whose family is actually from the Philippines. Uh, he may have been born there, came over very young. Here's a French one for you. And this represents some of the things that are at the core of what's important to him. You may not be able to read it. Some of you might be able to read French in here. I just want to point out two of them at the, at the uh, extreme corners. Entretenir uh, des conversations de leadership, accès sur le positif. Neil's attitude is he wants to end every conversation on a positive. And he feels so strongly about that, he made sure he put it in his personal brand. He wants people to know that he wants to be viewed as somebody positive and not just at the office. Neil plays basketball, he coaches softball. His attitude is, in his life, he wants to end every conversation on a positive. The bottom right one. La lettre action uh, constructive est un cadeau. That means constructive feedback is a gift. He puts it right on his document. If you're working, if you're working with Neil Gakula, I don't think you're concerned about trying to help him get better and grow. I don't think you're concerned about having a serious constructive conversation to help steer him in the right direction. Because he puts it right on his brand that's what he wants to be known for. He wants people to be comfortable to go and talk to him about areas that he can improve on, because that's what a personal brand is. It's about putting up standards that you want to be held accountable to. Here's Christos Retsinas. There's more stuff behind this. There's another four pages, but just to give you a flavor, attitude, inspiration, motivation. Uh, here's another of our directors, Phil Mancini. Now, if you look at that photo, you don't know this, but I realize that I look at it, that photo was taken in my office. 
I asked them to get a photo in my office. I recognize that painting that's in my office. Ever since we took that photo, my little change that I use for coffee is missing. Okay, so I think we're gonna have a full investigation on this one. As a matter of fact, if you ever see me do this presentation again, it's possible Phil Mancini won't be there. Okay, I miss him, I miss him already. But that's Phil Mancini, and here's his personal brand. And this is exactly who he is. Consistently on, he is always on. He is on at the office, he is on at a restaurant, he is a networker always trying to bring good people into our organization. Consistently conscious. He had a bit of a reputation problem. This is, Phil is one of the people that when we worked on his personal brand, it had a significant, significant impact because he wasn't always, um, I guess, respectful of some of the things that he did and his reputation needed some work. And one of the, thing was, one of the things was consider, conscious because he just did what he felt like doing without understanding the replications or the implications of that. Constantly exceeding, he's always trying to be the best. Constantly moving forward, leave stuff behind, he's always moving forward. These are just a couple of flavors for you of what we've actually been able to develop as a personal brand, and this represents exactly who they are. And if you look at these things, do you see anything about education, accreditation, sales results, etc.? No, all of those things are important. But these are personal brands. How do they want to be perceived? How do they want to be viewed? What we talk about all the time it is if you get transferred to another organization, you get transferred to New Zealand, this is the first thing you can take off of your wall, get to your new place of employment, and hang it up on the wall. Because it doesn't represent accomplishments, it represents who you are. Unless you get transferred to one of our offices of the future, which you may, uh, you may get a picture of what I'm talking about, where there's no walls and there's nowhere to hang stuff up, I guess you walk around with it on your tablet. So this is what, this is what we were able to put together. So you have a brand, whether you like it or not, find out what it is, define your aspirational brand, how you want to be viewed, how you want to be, uh, what, what, uh, what you want to be held accountable for. And the third one is communicate your brand. The brands that I showed you there, all of the directors have them pinned up in their office. They talk to the other directors about, about it. They talk to the leadership about it. They talk to their admin teams about it because you have to communicate what you want to be accountable for. If you want to run a marathon, if you want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, if you only tell yourself, what are the chances of that happening versus if you tell a bunch of people? and other people are following up and holding you accountable, it's the same thing with the brand. They don't put this in the drawer. This is what they want to live and they want to communicate. Is there a brand in, uh, in the world, there's a number of brands in the world, there's a lot of great brands out there that communicates as much as Starbucks. There is a corner in Vancouver I'm sure most of you are familiar with Vancouver, Canada, where there are four Starbucks, one on each corner. They are out there. They are everywhere. We see, I know they're making great inroads in Asia in the last few years as well. That is a communicated brand. When I think about Starbucks, I don't know about you, I think about paying a fortune for a cup of coffee. I think about having to order coffee in some foreign language, grande, venti, which are not Canadian words, but that is what I think about when I, when I think about Starbucks, but of course I'm just thinking, because I'm just kidding. When I think about Starbucks, I think of so much more. Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, every time he's on TV, he's not talking about how many stores they opened up. He's not talking about a new chorizo sandwich. He's not talking about a new coffee flavor. He's always talking about something socially relevant. They're involved, not just in selling coffee, they're involved in the world around them. If you followed that a couple of months ago, there was an issue in the States and they had to they shut the, the uh, restaurants down for half a day to do diversity training. I'm not here to debate if that was the right plan or not. All I'm gonna throw out there 
is their plan seems so sincere. They had an issue that they deal with, you just felt sincerity coming out of that organization. If you go onto their website, you will see uh, comments on the environment, comments on the community, comments on ethical sourcing of their products, comments on diversity. It goes way beyond selling coffee. I don't know what other coffee uh, stores uh, you're familiar with out here, but I can name a few out of Canada. I have no impression like that at all. So their communication goes beyond trying to attract you to have another cup of coffee. They have an entity. They actually have a personal brand within their, their business brand. It goes way beyond. So for Starbucks, selling coffee is what they do. Their personal brand is who they are. For our directors, our managers, recruiting, bringing people on board, coaching them to success is what they do. But their personal brands are what they are. So you have to communicate that brand. And I'll give you an example. Back to Steve Prasad. He communicates his brand so strongly, he is so magnetic. This is one magnetic character if you ever had the opportunity to meet him. Now, let's go back to that word magnetic. In our organizations, right, we're personally always bringing on people, inviting new advisors onto the team. We certainly uh, want to continue to do that. But everywhere in our organization, in our organizations, we're trying to bring the best people on, aren't we? Whether it's back office, whether it's the new vice president of marketing, we always have an eye to bring the best people on. The people that are responsible to invite those people onto your team, to make your teams better, had better be magnetic. They had better have a strong brand. And magnetic is not the loudest person in the room. It's not the flashiest person in the room. To me, magnetic is when you say something, do people lean forward? When you speak, do they want to hear more? That's magnetic. Everybody in our organization has to think that way in order to bring on the best people. I have read so many times that millennials, new generations, choose us as much as we choose them. Have you read that? They choose us as much as we choose them. Like, when did that happen? Like, when I left school in 1986, I was doing voodoo witchcraft in order to get a job interview. Like, you know, it wasn't, I was not in charge. I just wanted to get a job interview. They choose us. So as an organization, as people responsible for bringing people on board, you have got to be magnetic because they have choices. They have choices out there. Steve Prasad is magnetic. So in our business, and I'm sure very similar to you, we do a lot of recruiting in our, in our particular office. We bring on maybe 40, 45 people a year onto the team. We're always looking uh, for new people to bring on that team. It's rejuvenating, it's the lifeblood of, of what we do. And there's many ways to do that, right? So we use the internet, we use different uh, types of engines like that. But I don't have to show you a million scientific studies. The number one recruit, the number one talent that we're introduced to is somebody that comes from a current advisor. I don't know if it's the same for you. So we can look all we want on the internet, we can do LinkedIn, we can do Job Boom, some of the things that we have in Canada, but if you're not magnetic and you're not attracting people from current advisors that know the job, know what it's all about, you have a problem. Steve Prasad is magnetic. I went out to lunch with him uh, a few months ago and during the lunch, two times, and I'm not kidding, two identical stories. The phone rings, which by the way, I don't, I don't recommend that if you're at lunch with somebody, especially somebody that, that's considered your boss, that you answer the phone, but it's okay. That's, I'll, I'll deal with Steve on that another time. But the phone rang, identical story. I'm gonna say it once, but it happened twice, back to back, and you can hear Steve pick up the phone, and obviously it sounded like an advisor on the other side talking about to have somebody you should meet. And as Steve is struggling for a pen to write on a, a napkin or something to take somebody's number down, you can hear the voice on the other, on the other side of the line saying, Steve, don't, don't bother. 
Don't worry about it. You don't have to write their number down. I told them to call you. There's already a message in your voicemail saying they're available Tuesday or next Thursday. I told them they have to meet you. Enjoy your lunch. Right? How much better is it, does that sound than chasing advisors around the office trying to get one phone number, you know, to, to, to be able to call to get somebody on board? You have to be magnetic. Steve Persaud invites with his magnetism people onto his team and he gets those results. You have a brand, whether you like it or not, find out what it is, define your aspirational brand, communicate it and then live it. Walk your talk. Now, everybody knows Walt Disney. Is there an organization in the world that walks their talk more than Walt Disney? Not sometimes, not from time to time, all the time. I once saw a session with Doug Lip, who was the head of Disney University, because obviously they do a lot of training for their employees and, and such. And he said that about walking their talk, you will never see Snow White on a smoke break with her wig off screaming at the dwarves. You're not gonna see that. That's not part of walking their talk. If you've ever been to Disney and you see a young child bought a fresh bag of popcorn, stumbles, spills the popcorn, every employee, from Mickey Mouse himself to the person cleaning the street is empowered to get a fresh bag of popcorn, get down to that child's level, and make their day. It's magical. That's walking the talk. Doug Lip also talks about being on stage and off stage. So on stage is kind of what I am right now, right? On stage, off stage. And you have to know when you're on stage or you're off stage. Nobody can be on stage all the time in our in our day to day. It does not exist. But how many people do you know that if this is on stage and this is off stage, float around the middle, give whatever they have on that particular day, offer up whatever they can give in that particular moment, and just hope for the best. And just hope for the best. You have to know when you are on stage. It's as simple as that. Whether it's with a client, whether it's walking in the office, I have a leadership role, I have a lot of people on my team, and Tom will attest to that, I try my best to give my best when I walk through the front door. And maybe taking the elevator up to my office, maybe I wasn't feeling that good. But when I walk through that front door, I absolutely know that I am on stage. Give a little peek into another advisor on our team, Mike Musi. He's a great guy. Great guy. Lives in a little town just off, uh, uh, just outside of Montreal. Montreal, my hometown, is, a, is an island. He's just off of that island, off of the island. So a smaller community. Great market of lawyers, professionals. Solid character. Mike Musi knows when he is on stage. Mike Musi will not go to the arena. We play a lot of hockey in Canada. Will not go to the arena. Will not go to the grocery store. Will not go to Costco. Will not go to Home Depot unless he is dressed sharp and ready to go out into his community. He knows that for him, part of that is on stage. If he's working around the house and he needs more nails, more earth, needs some more bar uh, burgers for the barbecue, hamburgers for the barbecue, he goes in, does what he has to do before he heads out there. That might be a little extreme. I get that. That might be a little extreme. That's the, that's the way that he's chosen to do it. But he knows in his community, he is on stage. And I'll tell you a less, a less fun story. I have done the opposite. I also live in a small community outside of Montreal. Our kids are involved in sports. We know people there. I'm working around the house. Decide I need something. Head out the door, ripped shorts, dirty t-shirt, baseball cap, backwards, right? Just for that added classy touch. Go down to the, uh, the grocery store, small grocery store, walk down the aisle, 
and I hear my name. I hear somebody say, hey, Phil. Could be anybody. Kids are involved in sports. Could be anybody. Turn around. It was a young advisor that we had hired. This was about 12 years ago that this story happened. And he's still successful with the organization. And he may never have thought about that encounter ever again. I have yet to forget it. As I turn around and I see his name is Sammy Zekem, as I turn around and I see Sammy, I take a deep breath, I go over, try to get my game face on, try to have a conversation. The only thing in the back of my mind is I have got to get out of here. The seconds were like minutes as we're having a conversation. I felt brutal because of the way I was showing up in front of one of our advisors in my, in my hometown. I got back in my car, I'm already not a big guy. I got back in my car, started driving up our hill, and I swear I was shrinking. I was shrinking as I was steering the car. That's how bad and uh, embarrassed I felt. So I had no idea that I could be on stage in my little town. I will never do that again. Mike, Mike Musi may, may take it to another level, but don't do the opposite. As a matter of fact, we have so many events in our office that go from formal galas to barbecues to cocktails to informal dinners to inviting people to the hockey game. If I can give you a piece of advice, because it's so easy, and the younger, the younger that our, our directors and advisors get, you get a mixed bag of how people show up to these events. But ourselves as directors, managers, leaders of that financial center, we have a saying that we will always bear <coughs> on the high side. If Tom is not sure what to wear for any particular event, if I'm not sure what to wear for any particular event, our philosophy is bear on the high side. So if you're not sure to wear a tie and not wear a tie, if those are your two choices, wear a tie. If you're at a barbecue where you're saying, should I wear sandals or not wear sandals, or just wear a pair of closed shoes, wear the pair of closed shoes. As leaders, air on the high side. That's a way better feeling. That's a way better feeling than spending an evening at an event underdressed. Right? Air on the high side. If I'm inviting an advisor to a hockey game, as an example, I want to be the one in a, in a sports jacket and they're in a sweater. Never, they're the ones in a sports jacket and I'm in a sweater. Know when you're on stage and know, and know when you're off stage. Now, here's the fifth one. We're headed, to, uh, we're headed to a finish here. Probably the most important one is protecting that brand. So you know you have a brand, whether you like it or not, you found out what it is, you define what you want your brand to look like, you communicate it, you live it, you bring it to life, now you have to protect it. So back to our friend Ian Barrett, who we spent a lot of time building, building his brand, and, and building his perception or building the perception that people had of him, realized he could spend all the time on those first four steps and if he did not protect it, it was worth nothing. It was not sincere, right? So he had to protect his brand. The first, one thing that, that uh, Ian Barrett did was begin to work with Marija Saint Blanchette, we call her MJ, in order to help him protect his brand. Because sometimes you're good at stuff and sometimes you're not good at other stuff, right? Ian Barrett, again, that high energy, successful person, always hitting the finish line. Before he started to work on his brand and understand the importance of brand, if he had a team meeting, if he had a team event, he would have sat behind the computer himself and he would have sent out an email in some cryptic font, spelling mistakes, no color, Nothing like that. You see, Ian is bilingual. I mentioned already once or twice that in Quebec, we speak two languages. We speak French and English, which is a blessing and a curse for Ian. It's great that Ian knows two languages because that's just a good thing. The curse is he's not good at either one. So as he's trying to protect his brand, he's trying to raise the bar, he's trying to He's trying to influence and attract professional people onto his team. 
He, he had to protect himself from himself. So now he works with MJ, who makes sure everything that he does is top level. Small example, but if she's sending out that same invitation to an event, you can just picture it. Picture of where it's going to be, Google map, RSVP, time, address, confirmation, reconfirmation. You just picture it. So that people on Ian's team, that is the professional environment that they're in. When he's attracting high-end, success-driven people onto his team, that's the experience they have. That's the experience that he wants to continually deliver. And it feeds on itself. Ian, as, as a recruiter in, in our office, and Tom would know this as well, only works on referrals. Ian has not picked up a resume or CV in 10 years to give somebody a call. He gets everything on referral because he keeps on building this high-end image and, uh, and protecting it. As a matter of fact, Ian, who's a team player, he's a great guy, he's taken his game to another level because Ian has ambition. Ian, working on his personal brand, is now promotable. So we, we have something in our office where we do a mentoring program. Uh, every couple of years, Tom, Tom went through it for our younger directors. So Ian's a team guy, he's willing to come to the table anytime, and we got this mentoring program to help develop our younger directors to really get some insight from a successful director. Here's an example. This is for an internal audience. Okay, this is not for clients, this is not a recruiting, this is for five directors that already work in our audience. And when him and MJ put together the program, this is the result. This is Ian, what I call Ian 2.0. Ian 1.0, before he worked on branding, before he was aware of the implications on branding, would have still done a mentoring program, would have still helped out the team, and the agenda would have been written on a napkin, with half of yesterday's sandwich, all right? Ian 2.0 says nothing comes out of my organization. Nothing comes out of what we're trying to build as a brand that is not top notch and success driven. So that has changed, he's become, he's become very promotable from, from that work. I'm gonna end on an example of protect your brand. Uh, before we wrap up protecting your brand, And that's to talk about Ryan Lochte. Does anybody remember Ryan Lochte? You may or may not. 2016 Olympics, American swimmer, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Ryan Lochte has 12 Olympic medals. He is a successful swimmer. Somebody mentioned Mike Phelps this morning. We talked about Mike Phelps because he's the greatest of all time. Right, if there was no Mike Phelps, we would be talking about Ryan Lochte. One night during the Olympics, on August 13, 2016, his events were over, so he didn't have to compete anymore. The swimming events were over. Him and a few of the other swimmers went out in Rio. They stayed out really late, no big deal. They went to a, a garage, a gas station, and I guess maybe they were having too much fun, and they wrecked a sign at the, at the, at the gas station. So the uh, security guard came up to them and wanted him to pay for the sign and to, you know, to reimburse the damage that they had done. I want you to remember, at the time, Ryan Lochte was worth $3 million, $3 million Canadian dollars. I don't know what that is, Tom, in, uh, in uh, Taipei, uh, Taiwan dollars, but three million Canadian dollars. After this event, all Ryan Lochte had to do was the next morning get up, get in front of the cameras, and say, what an amazing Olympic Games this has been. These have been great events. Real Brazil have been outstanding hosts. Last night, me and a few of the other swimmers went out, 
we may have we may have pushed it too far we've taken care of it all is good and these have been a great olympic events instead what he did got in front of the camera the next day he faked a crime if you know the story they made up some crime that happened which didn't happen embarrassed brazil because making up that crime was a big stain on the police force and the security of brazil then he threw his friends under the bus to try to make himself look like a hero and a tough guy of course this came to light what do you think happened to his personal brand what do you think happened to his personal brand he gave away millions in endorsements and possibly a TV career, because he's a good looking guy and he would have been a TV analyst at one point. He didn't realize what his personal brand was. He thought his personal brand was about swimming fast and winning medals, and everything else would take care of itself. He thought his personal brand was swimming fast and winning medals. He didn't realize his personal brand was his character. And once he exposed the character that he had, his personal brand had no value. I don't know if you see Dancing with the Stars here, but he ended up on Dancing with the Stars. That was, a, that was his next step in life. So he took a severe hit into his personal brand has, and has not recovered. He will never recover from anything like that. Now, I'm going to end with a little, uh, a little story and just a description of what has happened in our office. So here's a, here's, here's a team sweater. It's not necessarily our sweater. Whatever, whatever sport you like to follow, right? Whether it's soccer, baseball, hockey, whatever sport you like to follow. There are two things on a team sweater. So we talk often in our office about our team sweater. What are the two things on a team sweater when you put it on? One is the name on the back, and the other is the crest on the front. As you work on the name on the back, so things like discovering what your personal brand is, or any other development you want to do, I encourage you to encourage the people around you to work on the name on the back, to build skills, to develop growth. And what happens in our particular team is that once, that once we get everybody involved, the collective bar raises. The quality of everybody on the team raises when they work on the name on the back. And what happens is that crest on the front that represents your team starts to grow. The pride for the crest on the front starts to grow. The commitment for the crest on the front starts to grow. And in our case, our crest represents our culture, our environment, the respect that the directors have for each other, and our desire to all win together. So thanks for your time today. And just to refresh the five steps of building your personal brand, you have a brand, whether you like it or not, find out what it is, define your brand, communicate your brand, bring it to life, walk your talk, and protect your brand. I encourage all of you as you step out today to think and reflect on your personal brand. Once you have a good idea on that, talk to people around you about personal brand. Become ambassadors of personal brand. Raise that collective bar for the people on your teams and watch the crest on the front of your sweater grow. An investment on building your personal brand is an investment on the growth of your business. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of the conference.